Have you ever wondered if the earth is old or young? If, if you've been a Christian for any matter of time, this has been a question in a discussion. So today I am very excited to have Apollo Jedi, also known as Matt, on the channel, and we are going to discuss young earth creationism. And so I am very curious to hear his answer to some of the questions that I have had. And um, he has been highly recommended by the Twitter force and other people. He has an entire website, um, which I will have all of his links in the description. So if you want to go and follow Apollo Jedi and hear more about Young Earth Creationism, here he is. But welcome to the channel. Thanks, Adam. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, we have crossed paths a couple times and uh, clashed just a little bit on Twitter. But um, I, I am very hopeful and very happy to have you on the channel and to have a friendly discussion and hopefully to show other Christians that we can. We can disagree and we can debate and we can discuss the Bible in a way that doesn't end in lots of misery. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, so Matt, tell us just a little bit about yourself and um, how you've come to be in this subject. Like, are you a theologian, a philosopher? You have come down descended from the upper echelons of the academy or well unfortunately that will not uh that my qualifications probably won't uh impress anyone any of your audience uh i'm just a lay person uh mm -hmm. mrs apollo jedi and i worship at a presbyterian church in texas uh by god's grace we have two children both grown uh, looking forward to seeing them tomorrow for resurrection sunday uh, but no, this is a, this is something I've been interested in mostly about the authority of God's word and mm -hmm. making sure that as we, that we read God's word, there's not an improper uh, interpretation framework. And mm -hmm. so through, uh, my study and reading, uh, I think it's important that we come together as Christians, be united around the authority of God's word and, uh, honor him through friendly conversations like this. That's see, that's great. So in brotherly here's conversations. Of, yes, yes. <laughs> so that's one of the major things that I want to clear up and have at the forefront, right? That this is really about the Bible. Okay. So both of us are believers in the Bible. We're believers in the inerrancy of the Bible. We're believers in that what God's word said is true and that we should follow God's word. Are we all on board with that, right? Sure. Sure. And we can even bring a couple other uh, terms into this. Uh, sola Scriptura. I think we both would agree that uh, the authority of God's word is at the magisterial authority, mm -hmm. the Sola Scriptura. And I, I didn't ask you previously, but would you say that you hold to the idea of the sufficiency of Scripture as well? Probably. Now, okay. I, I, I leave a small caveat, okay? Uh, and, and that's just to say that, so I, I've come across a few people that have really put in there the sufficiency of scripture being a little more monolithic than I'm willing to go. Um, but in essence, yes, I, I believe that, well, so if you mean the sufficiency of scripture is sufficient for salvation, for knowledge about God, for, for these sorts of things, I am with you. If you want to say that the sufficiency of scripture is sufficient for medical knowledge, scientific knowledge, and all sorts of other knowledge outside of its realm, that's, that's what I'm, that's the only, that's the major caveat that I'm pushing back on, if that makes any sense. No, and I don't think anyone <laughs> would hold that the sufficiency of scripture tells us all medical knowledge and nuclear science and those kind of things. Just that the, the idea that scripture is sufficient mm -hmm. to lead to salvation and uh, that it is a grounding for knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I. I'm a philosophy, a philosopher at heart. So like epistemology and all these other sorts of things, like it's like, yeah, that's, so. That's, but in general, I believe we agree, Matt. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, Very good. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Hey, you know, in, in part of our conversation that we had earlier, mm -hmm. I think I understand you to say that at one time you held to a young earth position and mm -hmm. Now you don't. Can you can you tell me a little bit about what it was that maybe caused you to not hold to that position any longer? What was it that mm -hmm. was the kind of the driving force to lead you out of that thinking? So so this actually I really do. I'm I'm really glad um 
Yeah, for this question, because there are a couple things about it. And number one, I want to also say that I have traditionally held that I have always even even now, honestly, I will tell you that there's a little bit of hope in my heart. I've always kind of hoped and desired for young earth creationism to be true. Um, now, it has been to me that I, I don't find it nearly as solid as I originally once did. And so here are some of the the things that started to bring me around a little bit. The first thing that started to this where this all started for me, because um, I've been a, I was a young earth creationist for most of my life, you know, most of my life easily. And uh, the major thing that I want to say is that not that, OK, now I'm an old earth creationist or a theistic evolutionist and stuff like that. The main thing I want to push is that I don't think that the scripture is nearly as clear concerning the age of the earth. I think that it's rather ambiguous, that it doesn't really say how old the earth is. So that's my major claim, is that I just think that scripture leaves the question open. And so what I would really say is that I've changed my mind about the young earth creationist interpretation. I would no longer say that I agree with the majority of the way the young earth is have um, interpreted the Bible. My first example that I came upon was Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. And of course, it just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void and formless. Darkness was over the surface of the water. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, right? And then it says, and then God said, let there be light, you know, and he separated the light from the darkness, right? So, I was pretty much stunned when I read that because to me, it seemed as though the scripture was potentially saying that, that he created all sorts of other things prior to day one. So to me, that's my first, my first thing that, that started to pull me away from a young earth interpretation. So I am curious what it is you have to say about that. Why don't you think, or do you think that there's a really solid reason? Do you take verse one and two to go together with day one? Are they a part of day one? How do you interpret that? I think as we look through scripture, it's not just Genesis one that holds things together. As a young earth creationist, I feel mm -hmm. like I can look at all of scripture and, and that's not just young earth creationism, but it's the, the, as I read this, the scriptures, it is the, what, when I read through it, what falls out is the young earth creation model. It's, it's a, it's a consistent understanding of the whole of scripture. So in reference to your question, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. We can look then also at Exodus 20, nine through 11. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to get to Exodus 20 so fast. <laughs> we'll, we'll, it, we may get there and stick and stay there. I don't know. <laughs> We, we might, we might. But it says pretty clearly, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. So when we look at when the heavens and the earth were made, it is within those six days. So when you talk about that, you think there was something prior to day one, mm -hmm. I don't understand what the concept of prior to day one, what would be something that would be prior to time that you would hold to that concept doesn't make sense to me i mean i understand That's, eternity yeah and god mm -hmm. is not bound by time but when we look at exodus 20 and all things the heavens <laughs> the earth the sea and all that is in them mm -hmm. were created in six days and you ask well what happened could that have happened prior to that mm -hmm. well i my, my answer is that scripture doesn't allow for it but maybe you can help me understand what do mm -hmm. you set what what do you mean when you say that something happened prior to day one? So I, I love this question. Now, I think this is really important. And honestly, like this is this this question is exactly why I want to talk about this subject. Right. Um, because I want to know as well. So just to clarify. Right. And so don't catch me as like I'm trying to deflect the question, but I want to ask a couple of clarifying questions. Are you saying that you believe that the six days of creation is accounting for everything that was created. Is that the point, right? That seems to be what Moses <clears throat> okay. was was compiling there in mm -hmm. Exodus. Right. And even in uh, <clears throat> Romans, mm -hmm. the creation was subject to uh, frustration, mm -hmm. all of the creation. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So 
I don't know Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. You know, you asked for my credentials. Well, don't I worry, haven't written worry. any books. I don't have any <laughs> uh, uh, suffixes on my name. I'm just a regular guy. No worries. No worries. Well, you know what, though? I, I really want to um, elevate that in the sense that, look, I'm a firm believer. We just talked about sola scripture, all these things. Who is our authority? It's not the guy with the PhD. The Bible is our authority. Exactly. So, I do not care if somebody else is like, well, Matt is wrong because he doesn't have a PhD is like, if you can show me from the Bible, I do not care what letters you have in front of your name. People have asked me before, what are your credentials uh, to be a critical of evolution? And I say, well, I have a higher degree than <laughs> Charles Darwin. I have higher scientific learning than Charles Darwin for credential wise. And uh, I have, uh, oh no, the, uh, and I have a higher degree than uh, Tesla. I don't think <laughs> Tesla ever had a degree. So That's right. <laughs> in the end, degrees and certifications can only tell us so much. Right, right, right. So, so here, here, here's, okay, now let's go back to your question. Let go me work to, on answering that. your question. Yeah. No worries, no worries. <laughs> Rabbit trails. But, um, okay, so to me, it seems to me that, okay, this is the six days of creation and those six days of creation are focused around mankind. So it's the six days of creation for mankind. So then it seems to me all too possible that there are some other things that God could have created prior to all of the creation designed for mankind. Now, let me give you an example, all right? Because of course that's gotta be the next question. Like, like what, what else could there be? Um, the really simple answer is the angels. When did God create the angels? And why think that he created them during the six days of creation? It seems to me that God creates them not mentioned in the six days of creation. And But we all, as far as I know, for the most part, most of us believe that God created the angels. The angels are not eternal beings. They don't just live in eternity with God. They were created at some point in the past. And so why not think isn't it very possible that God created them prior to the six days of creation? No. Why not? Well, let's look at scripture, our authority. Mm -hmm. I want to start uh, in uh, John chapter one. Yep. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Mm -hmm. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Yep. So he repeats that, that all things were made. Nothing has been made except, and it, it, it uh, John, w w in his writing, he was trying to connect back to, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a new revelation from Jesus was a new revelation from God where they had relied in the past on the prophets and, uh, the, the, uh, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now John is writing that gospel and John, he's connecting it right back to in the beginning. Genesis 1, that, that mm -hmm. the, the Hebrew scriptures, the law. So he's saying in the beginning was the word. He's identifying Jesus as being that creator. Mm -hmm. And then if we also look in uh, Colossians chapter 1, and I'll start in uh, uh, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things in earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is, the, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So when we look at those two passages, we can see that all things were created by God, in the, by Jesus, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is, the, this is a holistic view of, of the scripture. We, as, you know, we don't want to be tied just to Genesis 1. It doesn't just mean something because we try to isolate a single, single verse mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the scriptures. We want to look but, at the whole thing. But go ahead. But Matt, doesn't it say in the beginning? was the word and that exactly. he created all things in the beginning. Exactly. When why he isn't... created the heavens and the earth, there's a tie to that, right? Right. Why isn't that prior to day one? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth prior to day one. Well, it's only identified as day one. <laughs> I don't uh... think it's, a... well, and that's, so that's my further question, right? Because to me, here's the thing, right? I'm saying that, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with John one, one. But I'm saying that he creates it prior to day one. Well, and he that's creates why it in the beginning. That's but, why we oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean why, to why, So how, why do you connect verses one and two with verse three? That's, that's the question, I guess. 
because I agree with you. Everything you said, Colossians, First John, God, exactly. Jesus is the word. And I mean, you can even connect. There's a verse, Isaiah 43 or whatever, which talks about, you know, um, how God creates everything. So I, I completely agree. So we don't disagree yeah. there. Now we want to disagree about how we connect these two. The, the creation is throughout. We could we could have gone to Isaiah and you're at Jeremiah. There's lots of identifying Jesus sure, sure, as the sure. creator. Mm -hmm. But again, there's there's that Exodus 20 that seems to be such a sticking point for you. The heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them is is there identified in the within being bound by those six days. So again, help me to understand why okay, okay. We'll something focus on is Exodus prior 20. to those six days. And maybe tell me what the concept means. What is the what is the concept of something prior to time no 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 I, I would assert that time time and the universe come into existence in verse one or in the beginning when god creates everything not in day one what's the difference between the beginning and day one well obviously the the time between the two is the difference so day one is the <laughs> is the no 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 because day one it's the first day of the six days of creation so it's a specific creation but I'm just not saying that that specific creation is all of creation. Does that make? Do you understand the distinction I'm making here? So your 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 no. thing is that okay okay okay. You're saying that day one is the first day of all of creation. The beginning. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so okay. So I'll I'll go to one of my further points here, and that would be that day one, it doesn't say the first day of creation. So like there's evening and morning, one day. But why doesn't it say it's the first day? Well, I don't I feel I don't feel like I've got a good distinction between how you understand the beginning to be different than day one. Mm -hmm. uh, but in answer to your question, <clears throat> it doesn't say one day, it says day one. Sure. It's well da -da 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 -da. and you can I can almost see God saying day one. But further, we look at the, the, the days after that are all written as ordinals. The second mm -hmm. day, the third day, well, the fourth day. So a second day, a third day, a fourth day. The only the definite article is only used on day six and seven, which is extremely peculiar. So when we when we think about the the ordinals being uh, the second day, the third day, I don't think the the uh, you said a second day. That's right. I don't think there is an article at all in there, mm -hmm. which is why some translations say the second day and mm -hmm. a few translations say a second day. It doesn't make sense if we were to talk about there being a second anything. Mm -hmm. Second or third or fourth makes the most sense with the definite article. So mm -hmm. when you ask about day one, why was it not, why was it a cardinal, not an ordinal? Mm -hmm. We can say God was saying day one, and then the ones after that were subsequent to it. The second day, the third day, the fourth day, all the way through that they were, they were together. And by saying that they were just after that, it wasn't day one. And then years and years and years later, another day. It was saying the the second day they were they were uh, sequential. Mm -hmm. So so let me clarify some of this just for the audience who may not be up as much on exactly what we're what it is we're talking about. But yeah, so what I'm saying is that on day one, the first day at the end of there was light and darkness and all this stuff, it uses the word for one, and as opposed to the word for first. And then on days two, three, four, five, and six and seven, it says second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And so Matt is pointing out exactly this idea is like, well, just because it uses the word one doesn't mean that it's not expressing it in an ordinal fashion. Um, now concerning the articles, like you mentioned, it's like, yeah, okay. So it's not mentioned there, but then it is used there. Part of the point of why this seems significant though, is the fact that um, it does use the definite article in day six and seven, right? So it's highly irregular. Why doesn't it use the or, uh, ordinal articles? Why doesn't it use sorry, the definite articles in days two through 
uh, five, which is very peculiar. And, and, and all of us know that in apologetics, we hang on articles all the time, right? We all fight the JWs on adding the article a God, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was a God. We're like, no, 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 no. There's no indefinite article here, right? So I don't think that it's just semantics to fight over the difference between articles here. Well, I think that's why we we want to have we want to exegete the text properly. So mm -hmm. when if there's a question about, well, is there a uh, is there a problem with the bout, you know, yom, the word for mm -hmm. day in Hebrew has some flexibility. It can sure. mean a little bit of time. It can mean that when when it's read in its uh, straightforward manner, it, like in English, it means a day, just like we would think a, a regular mm -hmm. day. So there's some. If there if there is some question about what the boundary of that word yom is in Genesis one, is there a place we can go look somewhere else to see? Well, where, how can we find the boundary of that day? And that's why I want to go to Exodus twenty again. All right, let's go back and to you, Exodus twenty. And you let's mentioned that things were written in, in mankind's perspective rather than in God's eternal perspective because we we're not eternal. We 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 don't see the things outside of uh, what God has revealed. We can we're we're bound by time at this point. So so when Exodus, we look yep yeah. So Exodus when we look 20. at Exodus twenty for that boundary, we can see okay, God is asking His people to work for six days and then rest on the seventh in the same way that He worked for six days and rested on the seventh. And even the further clarification for that is, you know, He He says four and six days. He he made everything again. There's that there's that holistic view of his his creative works were done within those six days that he rests on the seventh. In that same way, we in in our human perspective are to work for six days and rest on the seventh. And there's no there's no uh, time in between days one and days two of our work week. We we work in those sequential six days and then we rest uh, on that sequentially seventh day. So. Th those th those things tie together real real easily within a perspective that we call the young earth creation perspective. It just kind of mm -hmm. falls out of the scripture as we read through it. So you would say that Exodus 20 is exactly analogous, that mankind is to live his life the same way that God did it in days one through six, right? So is it's, it's not a pattern. It's exactly the correct way, right? It works out six days and then rest on the seventh, right? We can read through that if you'd like. <laughs> And then no, no. and but see he... what the passage says. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold what the scripture says to that. Mm -hmm. Right. So are we supposed to go back to work the next week? Yes, of course. But God doesn't. God no longer does his creative work, but you mm -hmm. would agree with me that God has been involved throughout history. His creative mm -hmm. works have ended, but his work uh in, with the people of Israel and in uh redemption did not cease on that day. Right, but his work of creation does, right? His work of creation did cease, yes. Right, so these are the kind of works that are done. <clears throat> so if God isn't continuing to do them, he is still resting, right? But our, our work is not done. His creative works were done. Our works to gain dominion over creation are not done. He expects us to continue to work to gain dominion, as he said in Genesis 1, right. over all creation. So, so we're not doing things exactly the same way that God does them, right? So it's not analogous, right? It's it's similar, so it shows a pattern, but it's not exactly the same. I guess I, my question back to you would be, why would you why would you think it's not six days? If it if, if I, I agree with if six we days, six... I don't. I'm not disputing six days at all. So you're so you're a younger creationist again <laughs> that God God did create in six. I just don't think that He created everything in six days. Okay, I thought we I thought we covered that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I I, I don't see um, Exodus twenty as being perfectly analogous, right? So there there are two distinctions that I would make. One is the fact that we do go back to work, right? So it's a perpetual pattern. We we work six days and then we rest on the seventh. We work six days and we rest on the seventh, right? But God works six days and He doesn't go back to work on Monday, right? Yeah, I don't I don't see how that uh, affects what we call the young earth model. So I guess so, you'd have to come with something else to, sure, to show sure. why well, what I've keep... said is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, so there's a pattern of evening and morning, right? In Genesis one. 
right? Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why isn't it there on day seven? Don't know. Right. And so I would suggest because God's resting now, today is the seventh day, right? Isn't that what Hebrew says? No. Right? And it's talking about creation. What? How do, no. you, how do you view this as different? Well, just because uh, my birthday, has, just because I was born doesn't mean it's still my birthday. Mm -hmm. So that day ended. You know, I, I had a birthday. <laughs> Yes. But that doesn't mean today is still my birthday in the same way that just because day seven ended God's creative works, it doesn't mean that that day never ended. Right, right, right. So, but like, how do you understand Hebrews talking about entering into God's rest and the seventh, like, you know, so Hebrews like uh, four, um, where it's talking about, and yet his, his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day. Uh, in these words, on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest, right? This is Hebrews 4, 3 through 5. Right. So if you're going to equate, so I want, we, we need to be consistent as well. So if you're going to mm -hmm. equate that we are to, we as humans are supposed to rest in the same way that God has rested, then you would have to say that we don't go back to work on Monday, that Agreed. we would also, so that that would be an inconsistency to say that uh, the day seven never ended. That's that's exactly what I'm saying, though, is that's why to me it's not perfectly analogous, because there is a distinction between how God works the six days and rests on the seventh. Well, then you would have to then also say that we can't go back to work on Monday. That would That would make your position consistent. No, because, because I, I'm saying what I'm saying is that I think that we should interpret it as a general pattern. Like, for instance, they're the years of Jubilee. Why? Why is there a work six years and rest on the seventh year? Why? Why should we let the land rest on the seventh year? Well, the same reason, because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. It's a, it's a pattern semantic. It's not it's not simply a matter of you should be strict about this and be perfectly literal. That's that's what I'm saying. Just because something is in the form of a pattern mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it also wasn't literal. It would those those mm -hmm. two are not mutually uh, exclusive. Right, right, right. No, I, God I, is a God of order, and He does things in mm -hmm. patterns, and we see that all throughout Scripture. There are many patterns, but no one would say that uh, Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days was just a pattern mm -hmm. of Jesus being in the in the grave for three days. Those were, those were literal, literal events. Mm -hmm. And so maybe Jonah was in the whale for th 3 billion years. If we go by Hugh Ross's <laughs> uh, idea of how to interpret days. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so to me, it, it just seems like though that, yeah. So Genesis or Exodus 20, it's not perfectly analogous to Genesis six and the idea that it's like, Oh, well it's, we should follow exactly like this. No, we should follow the pattern that God has set out for us and that he segregated the seventh day as holy. Right. But just because he separates the seventh day as holy doesn't mean that it's like, okay, therefore we should do everything exactly as God did them because there are some significant differences with, with exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, you're, the point you're making is is the idea is like, yeah, well, then we shouldn't go back to work on Monday. And that's that's what I'm saying is like, well, exactly. We should go back to work on Monday. Why? Because a man's Sabbath or a man's work week is his whole lifespan, right? When man is done working, then he'll enter into God's rest. That is a very figurative interpretation of, of week. Well, I'm saying that's that's what I think Paul is, or whoever wrote Hebrews is saying in Hebrews, right? He's drawing on Genesis. That's what Let's he's saying. Let's not go to that, the authorship of Hebrews. We're, yeah, we've got no. too much to talk about. <laughs> Freudian slip. Well, actually, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion about that. but I don't either. So you and I can <laughs> not argue about something we do, neither of us have a strong <laughs> opinion about. Right. But, <clears throat> but I mean, do you not think that the author of Hebrews is appealing to Genesis and the seventh day or, I mean, and he's using it very differently. You, I don't, I don't think there is a, there's a strong connection between us resting on a Sabbath for eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't after, well, after our, after our first week of work. Right. But at the end our of first our life. literal week of work. At the end of Def our life, right? Definitely, we will enter into God's rest. The regenerate will, yes. Yeah. 
But isn't so, that because isn't that exactly there because that's what it means for a man's work week? It's a six days of work week, right? Man enters into then in God, man enters into God's rest, just like the Sabbath day. I think you've you've got a uh, a spiraling connection that that I don't think fits real well with what the script. There's a there's an interpretation you're making that a man's life is also a week. Mm -hmm. We 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 work for our lives, and mm -hmm. then we and then those who God has granted salvation, that's right, enter rest. Yes, that so, is what I would be saying. I think that's yes, what the Bible be, teaches. And I, I agree with that. Okay, but I don't I don't think that has a problem with how we interpret Exodus 20. Hmm. So, because, um, and I pointed and I, and I tried to point that out. It just wasn't persuasive to you. <laughs> and there are lots of true things that may not be persuasive to people. Sure, sure, sure. No, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but at least we're having the conversation so everyone else can, can understand and learn more. <laughs> We are. Um, okay, so hmm. Okay, so what you're saying is that um, everything is created. Everything is created in days one through six, right? In Genesis, and in and, and that in Colossians is Colossians and John. Yeah, sure, sure. And those are all connected through that. Um, so your point would simply be that Genesis is, just isn't really explaining or describing everything that's created, right? No, I don't think God gave God gave us a wonderful planet on which discovery is possible. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. that that kind of changes the uh the topic a little bit, but he didn't tell us everything in God's word. He just mm -hmm. told us everything we need for salvation and his plan of redemption. Mm -hmm. He's revealed to us those things and he's left many things discoverable for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Christians love science it there's a yeah. there's a, a trope out there that christians hate science there's a there's a fight between science and uh god's word but there's not they're in they're in perfect agreement okay so so let me push on to one exactly on this so i just want let me get some clarity though real quick on what yeah. you think about verses one and two of Genesis, right? Okay. So I, I've got I've got the idea that you think that everything is created. So do you think that verses one and two are part of day one? Let me put it this way: I think in, when when we read through the Genesis account, Genesis mm -hmm. one, two, and three, it seems to start at a ten thousand foot view. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. Yep. Then he zooms in, the five thousand foot view. Mm -hmm. I created these things on day one, these things on day two through through six. And we look mm -hmm. at Genesis two, and now we're getting into the weeds and he's yeah, zooming super, way super in, zoomed in to uh, the creation and the, the account of Adam and Eve and the fall into sin. So mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a cascading view into the things we need to know about. So mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't talk about in Genesis versus Genesis one and two of how he did exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. Creation next to Hilo. They're they're created out of nothing. He formed those things, and we zoom in all the way till we get to uh, the fall and, and this continuation of of history all the way through. Let me ask you a slightly different question then, contextually. Okay. Do you think yeah. that Genesis verses one and two, right, provides the context for with for which the rest of the chapter should be read? And so this idea of everything is void and formless, and there's waters over the surface of the darkness, or darkness over the surface of the waters. Sorry. Uh, that seems to also make sense that when, during the beginning of creation, when he created mm -hmm. the heavens and the earth, the seas, you know, the seas were, were seen as some place that was troubled and, mm -hmm. and empty and void. And those things make sense. So as, as we go forward in time in the passage of Genesis, it becomes there, more and more clear, right? He's, he's, well, he's, he's forming them. He's yep. bringing them together. He's making them uh, more and more uh, applicable for the glory of his son you know, mm -hmm. through human history. So without this order and things he's bringing to uh, creation bringing to order. Yeah. Bringing, mm -hmm. bringing these things into where, where they were uh, just the, the waters. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're going to put everything together so that there will be a glorification of Jesus mm -hmm. through this, this construction. So when do you think God created water? It's a, again, he didn't necessarily specifically say, but it's part mm -hmm. of that creation in day one 
okay. possibly day two. He did. He did. I don't think he had w the question like this doesn't make me think, oh, no, <laughs> I can't trust. Well, it doesn't make me it doesn't make me worry about either. it either, because <laughs> so. because I think God, of course, does create everything. I just don't think that he's talking about creating it all in day one or two or three. Like, in in fact, like it to me, it seems like does God create anything on days one through three? Uh, it it appears that he does. He created light, and I know I know you you'll say and and there was light. Let there be light. And there was light, so we. I would say that before. Uh, <laughs> there's not a before uh, on day <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> on day one, prior to God saying, "And there was light," then I would say there wasn't light. Okay, sure. Right. So when He says there was light, uh, how? Do, and if you were to say, "Well, uh, did He create anything?" How is light created? God may have just needed to say. I'm energizing my universe mm -hmm. because light is energy, you know, and if we look at uh, Einstein, E equals MC squared, light is also matter. You know, they're, they're equated in that. So, uh, well, so in the I, end he can say, I'm energizing my creation and there, right. there was light. And there's energy or whatever. So something like this. Um, now, so, cause to me, it seems like day three, he separates the waters from the land, right? Mm -hmm. And then day two, he's separating the waters below and the waters above. Mm -hmm. And then day one, he's separating the light from the darkness, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So it's all focused around the pattern of separation, right? So it's just ordering. I'm not against that. There's yeah. a definite, there's a definite ordering through time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I'll definitely say I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, yeah. I think God is, is placing order and, yeah, orchestrating um, things and stuff like that. So. So to me, some of the the patterns that we see is, yeah, first one is is this separation, right? It's separating one, two, and three, days one, two, and three, right? So I will say, oh man, I don't want to get, let's see. So to me, it seems like the literary structure would be another reason that it seems to me that I, I shouldn't be pressing the text. And, and now you've kind of actually alluded and talked about this idea. So that the idea is not that we should press the text for him describing every single thing that's made. Does that sound right? It just goes together. You include Colossians and John, and it's the idea that is like, hey, look, God made everything. This is just mentioning some things, right? Yes. Now, so to me, it seems like the context is that it's focused around the things that are inside of man's sphere of creation, but which is why it doesn't mention the angels. Well, he did in Colossians 1. You remember when I read that, the things mm -hmm. he created, visible and invisible, whether mm -hmm. rulers or powers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. These are yes. these are things. So I, I don't know why you're trying to continue to separate those things when, <laughs> when God didn't separate those things. But go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I know. We're, I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree because to me, I think God separates them in verses 1 and 2. Um, they're They're not the same as day one so because each day to me does seem like it follows the literary pattern and then and god said such and such and such evening and morning right and then he sounds a lot like history he and opens god said, and then and then and then that's very historical uh <laughs> language <laughs> well and i i am curious now i know i know i'm not going to convince you on this one <laughs> but but um because i i've I, i'll just say like um one i i I would just want to commend you because you do have some of the most comprehensive um, work and articles. If you want to go see more about young earth creationism, Apologetai Matt here has tons and tons of articles. So you can go through many, 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 many of them. And I, I read several of them. So, <laughs> um, Thank you, Adam. Yeah, yeah. So the literary structure, right? It has lots of elements that don't remind me of history. So this is my struggle. Um, now, do I think I, I am not here to espouse, oh, Genesis 1 is completely allegorical or completely poetic. And I completely agree. I've, I've read <clears throat> the articles on talking about the structure and it's like, does it mirror the poetic structures of Psalms or Song of Solomon or any of the other ones? No, it doesn't, right? But most theologians and stuff all agree that the genre 
is um, not well defined or very struggling. And some are trying to propose a completely new genre just because it's so bizarre. But here's the thing to me, and I'll just tell you from my perspective, um, and something that changed my mind was that it does not remind me of the book of Joshua or Samuel or lots of these other ones because of these literary structures. There's a pattern of, okay, first three days, separating. Next three days um, looks like there could be some filling in. I'm aware of the complaints against like a framework hypothesis, but also the numbering, right? It's like, okay, God said that occurs 10 times. Okay. Um, according to the kinds that occurs 10 times. Uh, God calls that occurs four times. God, um, Blesses. And it was good. And it was very good. Seven yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and yeah, it was very, it was good. Occurs seven times, right? But yeah, is, is the point that because it occurs seven times that everything is good? I think it is, right? Because day two. Well, seven is particularly important. I, I don't want to interrupt you. Let me, let me you finish no, your no, thought. No, no, Yeah, yeah. But, but it's exactly that point. Like day two is not called good. Why not? Why not? I don't know. And I think the answer is because it would have been eight and not seven. Well, there was one of the days where it was twice. That's right. That's right. So one of the other days, it's twice as good. <laughs> but seven is an important number. It's yeah. the, 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 the idea of perfection. Mm -hmm. So the idea, if we read through and see that it was very good on the last day, and the last one is a very good, the, la the seventh one is very, yep. that's almost uh, this, this Hebrew idea of bringing it to, and I've heard people say, well, good is not really perfect. And yet, when we look at Genesis 1, <laughs> God is building that up to the point where that's what he seems to be saying. This is my creation. I've created everything exactly the way I want. It's, it is without corruption. It is without, it is without sin. It is without death. It is very good. So and That same yeah. word is used <laughs> to describe God, right? Yahweh is very good. Yahweh is good. Over and over, we see that throughout the scriptures. But go ahead. I know yeah, you're gonna yeah. have no. something there. Well, yeah, about. I'll have. We'll, we'll definitely. There you go. We could move right into this next things and stuff. <laughs> Segway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect, right? Um, yeah, I, I'll say I'm I'm on the camp of yeah, it's good, it's not perfect. Um, now because part of the reason to me that I struggle with the idea of um, like I think that making it good makes it um, yeah, it's according to God's purposes. But would you really say that God can't create things like part? I'll, I'll say it this way, right? Okay, the beginning talks about, okay, there's chaos and void and all this stuff, right? And then on day six, the last thing that God does is he establishes man on his earth, right? And man is to um, rule over and subdue the land, right? And, ever, and all that's in creation, right? He's to bring creation under, under subjugation under God's kingdom, right? Under his dominion, yeah. Under his dominion. Mm -hmm. The so, dominion mandate. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm a big believer, right? So the dominion mandate, right? If creation is perfect, what is there to bring under God's dominion? So perfection doesn't, doesn't mean that we can't make use of the things that God has created. For, the, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, we, uh, God didn't create uh, magnifying glasses or microscopes or telescopes, but to bring into dominion would be to take uh, clear glass and shape it in such a way that we can we can discover things in the heavens or or look mm -hmm. into very small spaces. We're bringing these things into dominion for for discovery, for creative use, for artwork. I mean, uh, the pigments that were used in uh, for paints and things mm -hmm. they make no uh, they don't make artwork in and of themselves. So part of bringing into dominion uh, the pigments in nature in beautiful artwork is is part of that creative use that god wanted for mankind mm -hmm. to, to to put take his creation and make it useful make it beautiful uh not, mm -hmm. not that it can be more beautiful than what uh god created originally like a, a flower he talks about in uh in matthew the sparrow you know the sparrows are uh all the beauty that he has created and yet we can take part of that we uh Horses, domesticating horses was mm -hmm. something that mankind was able to do. Uh, d domestication of cows for, for food over time after the flood. But uh, 
I think the dominion doesn't just mean we are to chop down rainforests and mm -hmm. uh, destroy creation. We're to make use of it. Right. And we're to make As it good better, stewards. right? Not better, more useful for us. Right? I'm not sure. There's a point of just, there's, there is an openness <clears throat> to what that means. I'll, okay. I'll, get, I'll grant that. There's an openness to what that means. Okay. Well, let's put it this way, right? Do you think the earth was the garden of Eden or that no. they're very separate, right? There's, there is a distinction there. So man is kind of, um, I don't know if you'll agree to this, but I'll, I'll say it this way. This is the way that it seems to me, right? Man is to make the rest of the world like the garden. Yeah. I don't know that I agree totally with that, but we're to, <laughs> we are to bring it under, under God's dominion. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it seems to me like, yeah, there's totally work for man to do. Yes. Right. Work for honoring the Lord. That's right. Yeah. So would you say that all of the universe was supposed to be ordered prior to the fall then? Work was not a bad thing prior I, to the fall. Yeah, I agree. Right? God, work is God a good thing. tells Adam in Genesis 2 to, to work the garden, to bring mm -hmm. it. Uh, you know, there's, there's a difference between the work prior to the fall and the work after the fall. It was... It, it seems that the work before the fall was supposed to be uh, very, very fruitful. Things will just bloom and grow and uh, the, the work that mankind was to, to do. But then after the fall, part of the curse was that the land will not produce as easily as it did before. And then now the ground is cursed and it will produce and now it will produce thorns and thistles. It is, it is, it is very difficult to get the, the fruit of the earth. By the sweat of your brow, you'll, you'll bring forth fruit from the earth. It's difficult right more difficult right but the job is sort of the same and now it's just like hey what was going to be easy is now going to be difficult now by the sweat of your brow you will work yeah there's mm -hmm. a there's a definite difference right right but isn't the job the same i don't know that it's exactly the same there's there's i don't know god didn't speak to that okay <laughs> <laughs> i'll okay. hold tightly to the things that were revealed in scripture <laughs> loosely to those things that were not amen amen to that so i know that one of the other major questions that everyone in the world uh, is going to have is going to have to do with um death yeah okay? and we're going to solve it in this 90 yes. minute podcast that's it this is that's, the definitive view if so you're pick. not listening to this you don't know the truth that's that's tune all there is to it tune in you're going to miss it <laughs> Matt is here going to explain and I'm going to um, argue against him. <laughs> See, that's right. So, so uh, I, I will say that this is something else that of course, uh, coming up as a young earth creationist was a major struggle and issue was the idea or the subject that we're going to focus on um, animal death, right? It's the question of animal death. Is it possible? Let's just go with possible. Let's not get into, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to go ahead and say out there, uh, I am not a theistic evolutionist. All right. Just for clarity. And that's the other thing I want to make clear is this discussion in this context is more focused on the idea of old earth and young earth. It's not about just evolution, right? There are uh, many old earthers who reject evolution completely. Two notable ones, um, of course, are Hugh Ross. Last I checked, Hugh Ross hasn't changed his mind about evolution. <laughs> um, and John Lennox. They both believe in an old earth, but they are not evolutionists oh and my friend mark corbett see mark corbett's not an evolutionist Finally made it and and so um you shouldn't be either apparently i don't i don't know but um <laughs> he, he he dared me he said he he's like yeah you won't mention my name up there it's like oh yeah just watch me um so that's that's the distinction here now is it possible for animal death to be compatible with the bible um that that would be one of the major questions for you. Is that correct? So it, it I wanna, was for me. I'll just say it was for me. No, I, prior to sin, I don't think any of the nefesh animals mm -hmm. died. And I don't speak Hebrew, so I probably mispronounced that. But <laughs> no I think worries, there, the no Hebrew worries. word they, for, for yeah. animals would have been the, nef, the nefesh, mm -hmm. the, those, the soulish type animals. There was, there was no death. And I've written about this. We we can maybe link to that. Well, at the I've end. read some of it. I, I'll I'll clip whatever links you want. So 
But again, all that's coming from somebody else's work. Sure. Since I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but go ahead, finish your question. No, so, so for me or whatever, um, it, it was not so clear to me in investigating scripture that this um, has to be the case. So, sure. um, depends well, on let which... Me tell you, let me yep, tell you why I think it is clear in Scripture, and then go we ahead. can, we can yep. discuss that. Let's so, if we it. look at Genesis chapter 1 at the end, okay. in uh, verse 29, then God yes. said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has the fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and to all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so... So it's not, I don't think it's just an implication, but it seems to say pretty clearly that all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air, everything is supposed to eat the self-replicating food sources of plants. So uh, people all the time will say, well, didn't plants die? And those would not fit under this Hebrew word of nefesh. So a plants wouldn't, the Hebrews wouldn't have understood plants to be alive in the same way that today's modern uh modern paradigm holds that from bacteria to humans are all alive does that no, does that make no sense? compassion for plants matt mm. Mm. i listen just, i I'm love just... <laughs> me some good bananas and strawberries <laughs> and, uh right yes. next to the bison uh but anyway um there so there there appears to be that when we read through this there was no predation, predation. God did not give beasts over to other beasts for food. And one of the reasons we can hold to that is in Genesis 9, when mm. after the flood, God is having, making his covenant with Noah. Mm -hmm. And he says there in 9, 2, and 3, The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon, upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea that are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you just as I gave you the green plants. So there's a connection clearly back to Genesis 1 there. And I, hopefully you'll see that, that there's a strong connection just oh, as I'm, I gave you the I'm familiar with these passages, no doubt. Just as I gave you the green plants. So it wasn't just that uh, there, was, there was plants and animals to be ate by animals and people in Genesis 1. Because God is making a clear distinction in Genesis 9 that just as I gave you the plants for food, now I'm also giving you the ability to eat, the, the permission to eat animals mm -hmm. as well. So I think that there are a few different things here. So to me, it seems like a presupposition in Genesis 1 um, that the animals were not permitted to eat. Like I certainly grant, of course, the, God gives all of the plants for nutrition for the animals. But it doesn't have a prohibition on animals eating one another. Like, I don't see any reason to say that this is the case. And then when you include Genesis 9, Genesis 9 certainly shows a change in the dietary plan. But the only one that he mentions is Adam and ma or man. You know, he mentions mankind. Right. But there's nothing about animals changing their dietary plans in Genesis 9. So if we only go on exactly what Scripture says... Animals should still be eating only plants now. They shouldn't change at all. Everything should be exactly as it was in Genesis 1. There's no transition, right? Genesis 9 doesn't explain why animals have changed at all. Uh, Genesis 9 does, well, it does say in Genesis 9, there is a clear change in animals. It doesn't necessarily say right. they have a dietary change, but they are, they're, they're, he did change the animals at that time. So, so but here, here's, a, here's a major question, right? So are you saying that in Genesis 9 is when animals became predatory? No. I think after the fall, they became predatory. I think that there was a lot of animals that were eating mm -hmm. each other prior, after the fall. Okay. It changed all of creation as we see in Romans 8. Right. So, yeah. So you would say that all of the animals changed at the fall, right? But they weren't allowed to eat each other until Genesis 9 at the flood? No, I think animals are not, do not have the same moral obligations that people do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, believe I, there were, I believe there were probably people who ate animals after the fall and before the flood. Mm -hmm. But I think Noah kept his family pure and righteous. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a line the, sure, the seed sure, that right. we, as we follow the, the line of the seed through mm -hmm. scripture, I think there was a line, Seth's line, that remained 
true to the scripture and kept the the mandates that God had declared uh, in, in to His people in uh, Genesis one and two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it wasn't until after the flood that God said, "Okay, now I give you permission to eat animals." That that is now that is now changed. Sure, sure. But so I don't I want, see I any look, text that that talks about animals changing their eating habits. The, their their habits were definitely changed, but you you're right. It's not explicitly stated. Right. But I, I'm going to go to another scripture. Let's, yeah, look, at, yeah, let's yeah. look at Isaiah 11. And I, we, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. That yeah. In Isaiah 11, we see uh, that there is a, a change. There's definitely a change coming, where the wolf will will live with the lamb, a uh, predator and prey, the leopard with the goat, predator and prey, the calf and the lion. The, the prey and the predator will live together. The little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Again, pr- prey and predator. The young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Uh, the infant. So it seems to be that there is a there's another change coming. And when we look at, at Acts 3, 21, <clears throat> there is that uh, point where he says, uh, this is uh, Luke writing. He says, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets so the prophets a lot of times are referred to as uh isaiah and the other guys Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's it's not an unfair connection to say that the restoration that luke is talking about is this time when things will be restored to their eden-like state where there Mm -hmm. will be the, the, the prey no longer have to worry about uh, the predator as they do after the fall. Right. But it's uh, like, kind of like what we talked about before. I think there's a significant distinction here and that's exactly Eden versus the rest of the world. So I can fully agree that there was, yeah, probably no death of any kind, including potentially animals in the garden of Eden. Maybe, maybe that's how it was, but I don't see any reason why not to think that there wasn't animal death outside the garden. Well, Adam, Adam had to name all the animals, right? Did he leave the garden to name the animals? If there was an, mm-hmm. if if there was a problem yeah. with uh, animal death, and God mm-hmm. brought them him to name the animals, mm-hmm. wouldn't it, wouldn't there be a concern with uh, predators and prey in that same vicinity as Adam is naming them? I mean, there certainly could be. I mean, if we want to talk about like logistics no matter how we slice it, there's no like perfectly logistical way this is going to work out because like, okay, did Adam name the sea creatures at the depths of the ocean? It doesn't say that he did that at that time. <laughs> right, just right, right. Animal, just the animals. I mean, we go with what scripture said. Sure, he sure, named sure. The, he named the animals, the beasts of the field, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, so, but so the like- The birds of the air. So, but here, here's a distinction, right? That could go along with it, exactly what you're saying, right? That there's a transition of the relationship between animals and man based on Genesis nine, right? So remember that the, there, that is in scripture that is in Genesis nine, right? And now animals will flee from you. Why? Because now man is eating animals. So maybe mankind was completely vegetarian from the garden, right? But I don't see anything in scripture that says animals had to be nearly as well. So I, I fully can see this idea because the, the relationship between animals and man is mentioned as being significantly different. And now animals will flee in fear from man, right? So there's a, tra- a change in the relationship between animals and man, but there's also this, this strange command that shows up there, right? That anyone who kills man will be, will basically have a death sentence on him, right? Because man is created in his image, right? And this is also what seems to extend to animals, right? It's a prohibition. Animals shall not eat man or kill man, right? It is perfectly justifiable to kill an animal if he's going to harm a man, right? Even today, we don't tolerate animals coming after people, right? So I I definitely see this transition and this difference here occurring in Genesis 9, but it's not between the animals and themselves. It's between mankind and the animals. So I think that's really interesting now, but let's go back to this Isaiah passage. And the other one, of course, there's Isaiah 11 and then Isaiah 65, right? Mm -hmm. So my thoughts on these Isaiah passages is that they're largely um, hyperbolic. Now, don't shoot me. Okay. Don't shoot me just yet. All right. You got to wait, wait like a couple seconds before you fire. Um, 
but they're, they're largely hyperbolic. They're using hyperbolic language to talk about how peaceful everything is. Yeah. So Isaiah 65 is the wolf and the lamb will feed together, right? And that's exactly what you're talking about. Predatory, non-predatory, right? The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food, right? And they will neither harm nor destroy. But then it, again, on both Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65, it says something really interesting. It says, on my holy mountain, which is is analogous, again, to this Garden of Eden imagery, right? It's talking about God's sacred places. There will be no harm or anything in God's sacred places. But the big thing is that what are we focused on? We're focused on the new heavens and the new earth, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people are like, oh, the new heavens and the new earth. See, it's coming back to the Garden of Eden. But again, to me, the problem here is that there are several differences between the new heavens and the new earth in the original Garden of Eden, or however you want to put it, right? These things don't seem to me to be analogous. So um, one of the major instances is the idea of, do you think, and I don't know, maybe you do, do you think that humans are procreating in the new heavens and new earth? No, that doesn't, that doesn't fit scripturally. Right, we would say like, no, I don't think that that's, that's occurring, right? Um, but the other major thing is, it seems to me, do you think that people will die in the new heavens and new earth? No. No, right? Humans will then live for forever, right? Sure. But then how do we gel this with like Isaiah 65? So like Isaiah 65 is one of the verses, okay, the wolf will lie with the lamb, blah, 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 right? But it also says that humans will die in Isaiah 65, right? Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. So is, is it saying like, okay, so animals won't die in the new heavens and new earth, but people will? Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of that is necessarily connected to, uh, what we're what we're talking about here it never does it never does say that someone will die that's that's reading into the text it just says that if someone does die they will be they will be seen as accursed uh, but, but are it you saying say that, that it there is, will be death are you saying that it's possible for them to die no it, the, the text is obviously implying this implication that the one who dies at 100 right so i I'm, I'm not i don't know how that would say that somebody is going to die in the and new I, heavens and the new earth. I'm just saying that I think the text is using this language hyperbolically, like it's prophetic hyperbole. That's its primary focus. That's saying like I'm not against that hyperbole, but it does say that predators and prey will be restored to their former state. And I'm just so, saying that I think it's being hy hyperbolic. It's not being focused on being very literal concerning predatory and animals. Just because something is said to be hyperbolic doesn't mean that it's not also talking about a restoration of the way things were. It's it is definitely talking hyperbolically about whether a young person would live only a few days or someone who lives to be a hundred, mm -hmm. only a hundred. That's that that is definitely hyperbolic language that we would we would expect from the Hebrew. I want to I want to go back to a point okay. that we were talking about how it says there will no longer be any harm or destruction. That word okay. that is used is ra. Uh, and throughout the scriptures, we, the, the Hebrew word for Ra, mm -hmm. Ra, yep. um, not the God Ra, not the God Ra. You're not about no. to make an entirely new outcoming. <laughs> it's like, Oh, the God Ra. Okay. So again, we want to go back to this idea of what is, what does good mean? I've heard the people who hold to this, uh, ancient near East hermeneutic, the, the interpretive framework would say that, that the good of Genesis isn't really talking about goodness. It just means creating functionality or becoming functional. Have you, you, you're familiar with this idea that Walt yeah. talks about mm -hmm. that the, the ancient Near East. But when we look at how that word is used, you know, obviously no, no biblical translator ever chose to use that type of words mm -hmm. of functionality uh, in the translation of any, there's no Bible translation that would take yep. that and say, and it was very functional. Sure, sure, sure. And it was very useful. It was, it was very, it was good. It was very good. Mm -hmm. And that word good is used in contrast to evil. 
I think I've got it here, 45 times in the Old Testament. Good and evil mm -hmm. was brought. Good and evil. Good and evil are, are contrasted throughout. And this word uh, in, in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65, that there will no longer be any harm or destruction is that evil word, that, that evil that there will be no longer any of. That is in contrast to the creation. That was that was when God said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. There will no longer be any of this evil that is as a result of the fall. Mm -hmm. So when we look at it from that perspective, that it was good in creation prior to the fall, and there will no longer be any of this this destruction and harmfulness that He talks about with the prey and predator relationship. There will no longer be any of that, just like it was in the beginning when it was good. So this is the part where um, I'm glad you brought this up. This is also an excellent, excellent point. But um, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that it's evil for an animal to eat an animal. It is not after the fall, but it is harm and destruction. It is it is in that same category of things that are now broken, things that are needing restoration. There's a reason. I mean, uh, Jesus didn't come just to redeem uh, humans. He came to redeem creation. He's going to restore the creation. We see that mm -hmm. in Revelation. We see that all throughout. That it, it got Jesus' work is comprehensive. It takes care of, of, of everything. So you would say that today it is not immoral for a frog to eat a fly. No, but it is harm and destruction. And flies are in the category of the non nephesh animal. So <laughs> I hate flies. I have here, I have to show you. This is kind of, uh, I keep my, uh, my assault rifle handy at all times. Oh, yes, yes. I have an assault rifle in my house. Just let this be known that, it's uh, this it's, is the assault rifle that I. If that you guys I own. don't know if what the FBI that is, is watching. <laughs> this is a look at this. My daughter even got me a laser. Oh no way! It. So I've got the uh, the laser here. Yeah, so, yeah. If yeah, you guys don't is, know what uh, that is, that is the coolest thing ever. So it is, it is a fly terminator. Yours runs on salt, right? Salt. Yeah, it's an assault rifle. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. that's how we know that Jesus is the salt of the world and that he destroys evil. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably immorally uh, lure flies to their death. When we finish eating watermelon, I'll put the rinds outside. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have totally gone off the rails now. Oh, no, that was that was an odd subject, you know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> almost. <laughs> um, okay, so, so you now think that, that things that used to be evil are now good, right? Permitted, sure. Okay. Permitted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think that, um, I think that animals, they all function how they were designed to function. I guess when I look at creation today, I see a beautiful creation that functions exactly as God created it and intended it. I don't look at it when I see the circle of life in the ecosphere. I don't see a creation that is merely marred by sin. Like, I mean, isn't that the, if, if it's just evil, then shouldn't I revile in horror at the death of every animal? I think only a uh, young earth creationist can consistently say that seeing the death and uh, destruction and pain and uh, suffering of animals as being bad, as being saddened. We've lost pets and that, that saddens us. Uh, we see animals being eaten alive uh, on the Discovery Channel and this and that, all the little nature videos. And a young earth creationist can say that is a sad, that is not the way creation will be when it is restored. That we, we are in a state right now, there was, there was no death when God created it was very good. And there will be a time when the last enemy will be defeated the last enemy of death mm -hmm. and there will be and outside of though that boundary there there will there's no death uh mm -hmm. prior to the fall there was no death and uh when god comes in his glory to restore creation there will be no death after that but in between we see there is goodness in the world and yet we also see and we're able to as as a younger creation i, I can say to somebody who lost their pet that's very sad that's that is uh not the way uh, it will be in the new heavens and the new earth. But I, I think those who reject that view 
can just say, well, that's just how God created animals to behave. You know, you're just going to have to get over it. That's part of good life. That's, that's very good. The cancer that that dog has, that is all very good. And that's, that's, it would be in, that would be inconsistent to say, no, that's, that's bad because God declared everything very good at the end of his creative works. So at the same time, though, isn't it the young earth creationists who can't say that God created animals the way they are, that this is how they're supposed to be? Lions shouldn't have large teeth. Scorpions yep. shouldn't have poison. <laughs> that vipers shouldn't have all of these sorts of things. Things changed. It just, in Genesis chapter 9, we see why that the animals th clearly changed. But why should I think that the animals changed as a result of sin? Will we look at uh, Romans 8 as, as part of it? Um, that the, the, all of creation groans, all of creation is subject now to where it wasn't before the land did not at one time produce thorns. And now after Genesis three, it says the land will now produce thorns for you. So am I it supposed will be difficult to, to work. Am I supposed to hang the entire idea of all of creation changing on Romans eight? It looks no Genesis three. Also Genesis three talks about lots of things changing pain and suffering and death now enter into creation romans romans chapter 5 also says death entered creation and i know the uh the scoffer's view is that it was just the death of man but we look at first corinthians 15 the same way death entered as a result of the fall uh through the through the result the the uh, actions it, of one man but it is talking about death for men right it doesn't specifically say in in first corinthians 15 it just says the last enemy to be defeated is death mm -hmm. it doesn't yeah. say just human death it says the last enemy to be defeated is death right right, right. but all of that's it's very consistent with human death because certainly that's how romans yes, 5 is it more is specific. consistent with that but it doesn't limit it it would i think it would be inappropriate to put that boundary just, well it's not any it's not anything else death all other death is good but that would be what the scoffer would have to say. But death is a result of sin, right? Death is a result of sin. That's what the scriptures tell mm -hmm. us. So what animal sinned? Adam's sin affected all of creation. That's what Romans 8 tells us. <laughs> Adam, Adam was set as the federal head of creation, and he failed mm -hmm. in his duties. He failed in his duties to protect his wife, to protect the garden, to protect all everything under his dominion. And when he failed in that, he was the king of the of creation, and he sure. failed in that. And so when he failed, he uh, all of creation fell into this state of corruption. Jesus now all authority has been given to Jesus. He did it right, and so all authority, all of the restoration will happen because of who Jesus is, and that's why there will be no death. That's why there will be no suffering and pain and uh, crying in the, in the new kingdom. You know, another thing to, to think about when Jesus died, he took the pen, all these penalties for sin upon himself. He took the penalty of thorns, the thorns in his brow. He took those things upon himself. He took the punishment of suffering. He took the punishment of death, all those things he took upon himself. We, I think it's very connected back to uh, the Genesis three account. All those things are mentioned as curses of the sin sure the one that i don't see though is that of animal death well i think that's with a... animals eating each other or killing each other like that part i don't see and like i said not all true things are persuasive <laughs> <laughs> yes but the, the the thorns and thistles the sweat of his brow oh yeah i um I know you probably haven't watched as much, watch or seen as much of my content, but um, but yeah, I've seen a few of them. Hey, I have a, I have a couple questions for you. Sure. Can, or is now can we turn that around just a little bit? I know we're probably almost means. out of time. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, uh, am I right to understand that you hold to an an ancient Near East type hermeneutic or thinking? That's a very interesting way of putting it and stuff. I mean, well. Uh, I hate, I hate to ask you another question because I don't want it to be um, this way and stuff, but to me it seems like, uh, number one, it's like, yes, were the Jews in an ancient Near Eastern culture? Sure, I think that that's correct. Um, do I take this view, like, apart from the Bible? Well, no, I don't think that it's apart from the Bible. I think it's a part of the Bible, so, or, or it's a part of their culture. That's all I would say. If I wanted to learn 
more about this? What would be a what would be a good recommendation read, to read? read what, who Exodus. should I read? Um, well, read the Bible. I think you should read the Bible, of course, first and foremost, right? So you should read Song of Solomon, um, or I'm not. I'm sorry, not Song of Solomon. Solomon in the in the uh, when he builds the temple, and then you should also, of course, read um, Exodus when Moses is talking about the tabernacle. So both of them hold to having a um, inauguration of the tabernacle and of the temple. And I think that you should look at the imagery that's used. All of the imagery for both the tabernacle and the temple, the menorah, are all pointing back to the Garden of Eden. So that's pointing back to the garden in reference to the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, the cherubim that surround the garden. Um, and then, of course, the, yeah, the time frames. It's the idea that seven days is, as you expressed it earlier, is significant and a symbol for perfection. But a symbol for, for, for perfection, yeah. It was in the ancient Near Eastern days and stuff like that. And so it's a matter that it's like, yeah, everybody at that time understood what seven days represented. And they often represented temple inaugurations. Now, if you actually did, yeah, you wanted a book. Now, the book that I um, enjoyed the most and that I thought was very interesting on this subject uh, was John Soden and um, Johnny Miller's book. So they were the one that um, I'll just say like, yeah, I, I, Walton didn't, uh, he didn't convert me. <laughs> um, but, um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's the shortest answer. Sorry. Okay. So it would, you, you said that as if I've never read the Bible, you should just read the Bible. I, it would be, uh, it would, I've, I've read through the whole Bible mm -hmm. uh, at least a dozen times. Sure, sure, so sure. So it's not, of course, that just be as a function of me being an old man. Not, <laughs> not that I'm... Well, don't get any older, Matt. So, well, how mean. <laughs> I do plan to get a little older anyway. Well, okay, okay, never mind. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, I appreciate uh, that. It, it, conversely, and uh, not... Uh, incorrectly i would say that to read to uh, to have a young earth perspective one should also read the bible yes yes and there is no need to have a guru to come in and tell me this and that and the other not that there are things outside of scripture that can't help us understand things mm -hmm. i'm not against reading things outside of scripture but i think the problem that i have had with the the ancient near east hermeneutic mm -hmm. is that without those things I've been told that I can't understand scripture correctly. Mm -hmm. And that I think is what is a, is a huge problem I have mm -hmm. with that John Walton. Uh, it, he is a guru that says you can't understand scripture unless you buy my books and read what I have to say about this, because mm -hmm. the it, all of all of his, the whole history of the church didn't have access to these things. So now that I have written my books now you can understand and mm -hmm. understand scripture correctly. So it's wanna... almost like a sola scolera. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Got to it... have the appropriate scholarship, and they're they're the highest authority rather mm -hmm. than the scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've don't I don't need the, uh, the the particular scholar who believes one specific thing about a certain area to tell me what the, the scriptures say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, the more you get to know me, the more you'll understand that I certainly oppose uh, Sola Scolera. <laughs> yes. I am a big opponent. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that all our, all the arguments that we've talked about up to this point, yeah, I, I have come to long before that I, I came to this uh, other conclusions and stuff like that. Um, so in short, though, I do generally hold to a temple inauguration view and the idea that it is six literal days that culminates in an inauguration of God's temple that in short, so that everyone else catches up because I know what you mean when you say ancient Near East, when you say like all of those sorts of things. Um, but many of my friends and others don't. And that would be the idea that the point of Genesis one isn't focused as much around uh, a literal six day creation, but that it's more focused on uh, a temple inauguration that God is inaugurating the universe to himself and that he on day six establishes mankind as basically his vice regent to 
rule over, have dominion, and advance his kingdom in his name. Now, so that's for the clarity as well, for all of your fans and your listeners, for all of them going like, okay, wait, what does this Adam guy actually believe? That's, that is what I believe. And if you want to attribute or, you know, slap on other titles to my name, I, I get it. But yeah, so that's for clarity's sake to everything that what Matt is saying. And so I'm not against the temple inauguration. I don't think that there's a, I don't think there's a disconnect. If God was creating the the earth in order to mm-hmm. do a, a temple inauguration, I don't think that is yeah. in any way uh, independent of a young earth model. No, there, and y- you know no what? There's no reason I, to feel like they're at odds with each other. I, I other than it... trying to bring in this sure. before, this prior that doesn't seem to fit things well. But no, I, I want to piggyback exactly on that. You can be a young earth creationist and believe in a temple inauguration view. And I, I, I exactly, that, yeah. I exactly want to put that out there. And actually, um, so this is actually in one of my other videos. And I said this to somebody else, they're like, oh, well then, you know, why old earth, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you can be a young earth creationist and hold a temple inauguration view. And so I, I further want to just second that, that you want to be a young earth creationist and believe in a temple inauguration, go for it. You know, one of the reasons that I want to talk about a temple inauguration view is because it tells me more about what you believe about the Bible than it does science and all this other stuff. Because for me, and me and Matt were talking a little bit about this before, but you know, when someone says, oh, I'm an old earth creationist, I have no idea what you believe about Genesis 1. I have no idea what you think about Exodus, you know, except for that, yeah, you probably don't take it super literally, right? And so I would love for the conversation to begin to change a little bit where it's a little bit more clear what somebody believes about the Bible, because like me and Matt have been talking about, the Bible is what actually matters. Um, and so I'm I'm open to saying like, hey, look, you can be a young earth creationist and believe what I believe about Genesis 1. Um, my major point is that I think that the text is more open, that it could be that there are these other rooms that, that it doesn't necessitate all these things as we've argued here today. So, um, yeah. Did you have another question or? No, I probably need to start getting, I know, I know we got to, if, if we want to try a, a part two, I'm open to that, but just to finish, go for it. I don't necessarily care specifically about the age of the earth, except that's what the Bible seems to teach. Mm-hmm. When I look mm-hmm. through scripture and I re- and I read through it and I try to understand and I want to be consistent in my interpretive methods. Mm-hmm. That just seems to fall right out when I when I read through the scriptures. It's the most consistent that I have come across. And I and if someone wants to try to convince me otherwise that young earth is wrong, then you need to buy my standard, the the standard of God's word. You need to mm-hmm. show me by what standard where I have had a failure to be consistent in my interpretive methods. So far, I've not been, uh, I've not been swayed by Hugh Ross's account Mm -hmm. of, and I know you said he's not an evolutionist, but he is a cosmic evolutionist. He is a galactic evolutionist, a stellar evolutionist, a chemical evolutionist. He believes in all this, this evolution of things that have just uh, been able to form on their own he's just not a biological evolutionist. That, that is so, true. Yeah. You I'm, are, you I'm, are technically correct. So I know that, uh, that when we talk about evolution, it's most often attributed to mm-hmm. biological evolution. Anyway, uh, the, the, a, the ancient near East methodology seems to leave a lot of inconsistency. When I read through scripture and try to understand it, they're, they're open to a local flood. They're open to death before sin. They're open to a lot of things <clears throat> that doesn't, that doesn't seem to fit contextually with how I understand uh, the scripture. So uh, my biggest thing, as I said, is is our magisterial authority as God and his revelation of his word. And I think you and I agree with that. So when, when people try to come in with scholarship, the scholars have the highest authority or uh, science has the highest authority or politics or culture or society have all this, they give these other things authority to redefine God's word that's where I'm going to, I'm going to be that, that person standing in the, the tide coming in and I'm not, I'm not going to budge on other authorities being able to come in and redefine God's word. So that's, that's my biggest deal. And I'm, I'm glad mm-hmm. we've been able to have a, a, a friendly discussion about it. And I don't think that you necessarily disagree with that, that closing statement about the, the authoritative methods that all. we, 
that we say we want to be consistent. We want to keep God's word as its, as its rightful place as the magisterial authority in our interpretive, the sola scriptura, no sola scholarship, as uh, we've talked about. So, Adam, thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, man. Uh, I hope this goes well. Let's continue uh, friendly, brotherly discussions. And if we need to have a part two, we will. Thanks so much for being open. And yes, you can find him at uh, Matt at Apologetai. And um, I'll be sure to have all of his links in the description below. And uh, yeah, yeah. Here's to another great brotherly discussion on the Bible. Thanks, Adam.